It's our turn, episode number 38, two-player games. In this episode, Sarah, Jesse, and I talk about two-player games, and I interview Tanya DePass about diversity in gaming. This is the Dice Tower Network, adding games to your wish list since 2005. Hosting for this episode is generously provided by our fantastic patrons on Patreon.com. If you'd like to help us out by pledging $1 per month or more, please visit Patreon.com slash OurTurnPodcast. We'd like to send a shout out to our newest patron, Valerie. Every dollar helps to keep this show going strong. Thank you, Valerie. Hi, welcome back to Our Turn Women on Gaming. I'm Kathy. I'm Sarah. So, Sarah, what have you been up to since the last time we got together? I have actually managed to play some games. I wasn't Yay. really sh- Yeah, I wasn't really sure with the Kickstarter keeping us so busy. I was afraid I actually wouldn't have anything to talk about, but thankfully in the last uh, week I've been able to get a few games to the table cuz our Kickstarter ended on a very good high note. I don't remember the exact numbers, but raised over 35,000 and about 750 backers, so very happy with how that has gone. Very cool. Congratulations. Thank you. So for the first game that I will talk about, it is Unfair. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> I knew I had to try this. It just wasn't an automatic buy. So Unfair, designed by Joel Finch, published by Cool Mini or Not uh, in this year, 2017. It's a two to five player game in about one to two hours. So your goal is to build the biggest and best theme park, whatever it takes. Over the course of the game, you build attractions and upgrade them. The more you upgrade each attraction, the more points it's worth at the end of the game. Bonus points can be earned from blueprints if you can meet their requirements. But you got to watch out for events as your opponents may choose to play them against you, shutting down your rides or destroying your upgrades. But you can do the same back. And don't forget that simply making money will earn you a lot of points too. So there's many ways to victory, but also many ways to tear down your opponents. Finding a balance between pushing yourself forward and stepping on your opponents is key to winning at Unfair. So as I said, this was one that we were interested in, but not really sure we'd like because we love to build things up and a theme park sounds like fun, but we don't really care much for such a high level of negative player interaction. Thankfully, our dear good friend JT has really helped save us a lot of money by letting us borrow quite a few games that we're unsure of. And he's helped us confirm that we did the right thing in not buying them. So Unfair joins the list of games we don't want to buy, which includes Pandemic, Pandemic the Cure, Roll for the Galaxy, Clank, and probably something else I can't remember right now. However, Unfair is one I'd play again if certain cards were used. And this is why it's not worth us buying it, because there there are ways to make the game nicer and shorter, which we tried out. Certain themes have a lower level of negative player interactions like pirates and robots. And certain game changer cards changed how the game played. So I like First Date, which made the game shorter. We also played with the one that has you start with a super attraction already built. But in the end, I will say this is a good game, but still not quite for me. I will play it again with a certain setup, but will otherwise pass. So I'll give it a 3.5 out of 5. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't sure if this would be a game that you would enjoy because of the take that aspect of it. I think it depends on who you play with. True. You know, like I've said in the past, when Mark and I play a game, we go for blood. So there's (laughs) lots of take that and everything. But I have played also with groups where we just do our own thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're forced to play something on somebody, well, then you play it on the player that's doing the best. Yeah, that makes sense. They come to expect that. Right. They've got a target on their back. But for the most part, though, you just you don't do that part. So yeah, it just depends on who you're playing with. And if they play the same way that you play. True. And actually, in the games that Will and I played, we very rarely did negative cards on each other. The thing is, it's built into the game with the city cards in the second half of the game. Mm -hmm. They negatively affect everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's integral to the game. So that's why I like the first date, because it took two of those cards out. So instead of four rounds, 
a negative effects. There's only two. So that made it more tolerable. There are take that games that I like, but they tend to be shorter and less about what you build up or more is that they're temporary building. In a game this long, where you're building up something that's going to earn you points at the end of the game, not just score at different points during the game. Yeah, I just don't like the kind of tearing down. I think for me, it's specifically when take that is combined with a building style game when you're building something up. But otherwise, there's plenty of short take that games that my brain is just completely completely blanking on. Oh, Captain Carcass. I love Captain Carcass. It's a um, push your luck, take that style game. And so for that, I'm perfectly fine with it. I'm cutthroat. I love the game, but it's also shorter. And if you lose, you just set up and play again. This is not a game you'd play twice in a row. Okay. But yeah, I can see why so many people like it. It's a solid game, just has two conflicting mechanisms for me. Okay, that's fair. My game, as people remember last time Sarah and I were together uh, on an episode, I announced that I had a shelf of 83 unplayed games. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not alone. (laughs) And then Mark and I discovered Half Price Books. Ooh, that's dangerous. And we didn't go there to buy books. We went there and bought games. Yep. So I'm going to talk about one of those games we bought, but... I think we went up to 87 now. So we're working on it. We're working on it. All right. So the game that I'm going to talk about is called Artifacts, Inc. It was designed by Ryan Lucat, who I believe also did Above and Below and Near and Far. Same same art style. And I know he does the art for his games as well. And it's published by Red Raven Games and was published in 2015. And this has been a game that's been sitting on my unplayed shelf for quite some time. I'm not sure why it just did. This game was a little interesting to play. It has a central scoring board. And in the center of that central scoring board, you put this deck of cards that are called the U cards. And U stands for underwater. So it's your if you get those cards, you're you're diving underwater for stuff. But this is an archaeology style game, very similar to Lost Cities, or I think you said Thebes was an archaeology style game. Yeah, you have these cards in front of you. And your adventurer card determines how many dice you get to roll. And then you take those dice and you place them on the different actions that you want to take. So for instance, if you want to gather fossils, you have to roll a one and then a three or greater. And they both have to go on that. But when you put two dice on there, you collect two fossils. Another one is gems. I think you had to have a three or greater to get gems. And then there's also statues and scrolls. And when you sell these items to the museum, you get money. And then you can also use that money to go and draft cards from a, basically, it's kind of a market. Some of the cards you can just buy for money, and they give you different abilities. Some of them, their abilities depend on them being next to a specific type of card. So you have to be very careful where you place these cards in your tableau. You're only allowed to have two rows of cards. Your starting cards are on the top row, and then any additional cards can either go out from the top row or they can go on the bottom row. But for them to be touching, they either have to be to the right or left or to the top or bottom. Diagonally doesn't work. You play this game until somebody gets to 20 And then there's some additional scoring based on who's got majorities in the different museums. It was a fun game. It took us about 30 minutes to play, uh, maybe a little bit longer than that. Mark beat me handily. He got the hang of using the underwater cards really quickly. And that gave him a lot of extra bonuses. And he also upgraded his cards a lot more quickly than I did, which gave him more prestige points, basically. So our final score was 27 to 19. So, you know, I didn't get totally trounced, but but it plays really well two player and it does play up to four. So now that we've got the rules down on this game, I'm looking forward to taking it to a game day and seeing if we can't get a four player game going and see how that goes. We think it'll be a lot more cutthroat at four player. Have you played this one before? Yeah, Will and I like it a lot too. We've played it I think just twice now. Interestingly, so Will and I are big fans of Ted Ausbach's City Trilogy, Suburbia, Castles of Mad King Ludwig, and then his third one in that series was Colony. Now, when we got Colony, we kind of liked it. It was a little frustrating on some some aspects. I won't go into it too deeply, but 
playing through it mechanically, the theme gets completely lost. It's just way too focused on getting all the dice to work. And it's just felt cumbersome and bloated. And then after we played that, we played Artifacts, Inc. I love Artifacts, Inc. And it's pretty much fired Colony for me. Oh, wow. We won't get rid of Colony yet because we still really like Ted Allspec's games. So we'll probably keep it to have the trilogy. Although palaces of mad king ludwig's coming out soon so it won't be a trilogy anymore but anyways yes i love artifacts inc because it's streamlined the theme is always present because the mechanisms don't bog you down so much that you're just looking at dice you actually like you're saying you're gathering scrolls and fossils and you're trying to do these different actions to get them sold to the museum and so on and so forth and it just works so much better and in like not even half the time, like a quarter of the time, because Colony just felt long and bloated and cumbersome. And Artifacts Inks just does everything right. So yeah, love the game. Highly recommend it, especially, unfortunately, over Colony. Well, interesting. If you ever decide you want to get rid of your Colony game, (laughs) let me know because I will be happy to buy it from you. I will let you know, but I'd have to get it out of uh, Will's hands because as much as I'm not a huge fan. He still likes it. But at this point, he'd have to suggest Colony to play. I don't think I would. If I felt like in that mood, I'd suggest Artifacts, Inc. But okay, you'll be the first on the list if we get rid of it. Okay. So I gave this a rating of a four. It's a good game. And that rating may go up as we play it more. But for right now, I thought four, it's a good solid game. And I'm looking forward to playing it again. And I'd like to, like I said, like to see how it plays four player. Yeah, that's one thing we haven't tried. We've only played it a couple times, just the two of us. So it'd be quite interesting to see how it plays with more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. What's next for you? Quest of Valeria. Several months ago, I, th- I think it was back in April, we played it once. And we really were really trying to get two plays close back to back. That just didn't quite happen. I had a hard time really grasping Quest of Valeria when we first played it. But over the weekend, we wanted a short game to play. I didn't really want to learn a new game. And so Will's like, well, we kind of already know how this plays. We just have to kind of refresh ourselves on the rules. So let's try it. So Quest of Valeria is designed by Isaias Vallejo and published by Daily Magic Games. It plays one to five players in about 20 to 45 minutes. I kind of call this Lords of Waterdeep, the card game. And because there's a lot of similarities, you play the role of a guild master, which gives you a bonus for completing certain types of quests at the end of the game, much like the Lord in Lords of Waterdeep. You're recruiting and setting citizens to complete quests that earn you victory points, much like in Lords of Waterdeep. But the key here is that as you hire citizens or complete quests, they often give you free actions. So the more you can combo the order in which you hire and or complete quests, the better you'll do. And the game end is then triggered once one player finishes five quests and the player with most victory points at the end of the game wins. Like I said, when I first played the game, I just couldn't quite wrap my head around the comboing focus of the game because I was still thinking too linearly like Lords of Waterdeep. I also made the mistake of trying to hire citizens from my hand, which you can do, but it's almost always the worst choice possible because you need to have cards to discard to hire citizens because that's your money. So in the second game, I treated my cards simply as money and I only ended up hiring one card from it. I think that was just the turning point for me. It finally clicked and I was able to play well and I was able to beat Will. It still wasn't like a huge gap. I didn't trounce him, but I was finally able to win, whereas he really trounced me in the first game. So I give this a solid four. I don't think I'll always want to play it, but I probably will if asked. It's just quite enjoyable once you get the combo card effect going and it has a lighter experience like Lords of Waterdeep. Cool. So you're enjoying it better than you were initially. Yeah, because I got a little too stuck going in a straight line. Because you can do that in Lords of Waterdeep. You just go from one quest to the next quest. And in this, sometimes it's just not as straightforward. And you have to think more about how can you maximize your turn. So I guess part of it is it's more tact, a little more tactical, where Lords of Waterdeep is more strategic. And so making that brain shift I, was a little difficult because I'm always better at strategy than tactics. But often, yeah, me too. Yeah. But uh, so let's say there's a bunch of citizens in the row and one of them lets you hire another 
because normally you only have two actions. But if you hire one and it gives you a free hire, you still have to pay for it in cards, but you'd be able to hire another person. You may or may not need that person right away, but it's better to go for it because you probably will find a use for them later. Whereas in Lord's Waterdeep, I'm usually much more linear of, okay, I need warriors, I need rogues, let's do this thing, you know? So... Yeah, so it was definitely a mental shift. So now I finally get it. But I think I had the same problem with the other Valeria game, Villages of Valeria. Both of them feel so similar to other games I've played, but they're different. And so I went in thinking too much that they were the other kind of game. That's the downside of whenever someone compares a game to another game. They're like, oh, this is like so-and-so, but lighter or so-and-so, but heavier. And then you start thinking that way. And in some cases, that works fine. But in this, it put me in the wrong mindset. Ah, okay. Yeah. All right. And so you give it a four? Yes. Solid four. Like I said, uh, I definitely enjoyed it. Okay, yeah. good. My next game was one that we bought at Half Price Games. It's still in the shrink wrap. So we thought, nice. all right, yeah. good deal at Half Price Books. And it's the Lord of the Rings dice building game. Hmm. And this was designed by Mike Elliott, Eric M. Lang, Brett Myers, and Jeff Stahl, and was published by WizKids in 2013. And it uses the artwork or the the photography from the movies. Oh, okay. And it encompasses all three movies. So nice. It's not just Fellowship of the Ring, for example. I want to start by complimenting WizKids on the box insert because it comes with 97 dice. Whoa. Yeah. This is a Quarriers variant, Ah. apparently. I have never played Quarriers. So I had no idea what it was, what to expect, anything like that. But it has these neat little dice holders, and then their lid fits over the entire thing, and it holds everything in place. And over the area that goes over the dice, form fits to the dice. Nice. So nothing is moving once you put this lid on. There's places for the cards. There's places for the bags. There's places for the little cubes you use to keep score with. Based on the instructions that came in the box, I give this game a one. (laughs) Those instructions were awful. They were awful. The components are great. The cards are great. They're nice linen finish on them. The player mats are a little flimsy. They're akin to what you get in like terraforming Mars. The bags are, yeah, they're okay. They're functional. They're not you know, soft and velvety, but they're kind of that stiff velvet feel. You know what I mean? The yeah. Big velvet. Yeah. Like I said, based on the instructions that came in the box, we this is supposed to be a 30 minute game. We gave up after three and a half hours Ooh. of trying to play this game. Oh, that's wrong. And having to go back to the rule book and going, but I don't understand. And, you know, Mark would look at it and we be like, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. So then I would look at it and it still didn't make sense. Or, We just finally gave up and we mentioned it to our friend Dwayne, who has played Quarriers. And he said, oh, yeah, I've heard about that one. They redid the rules and you can download them on the games forum on BGG. So today we downloaded the rules from BGG and sat down to play this game again. It still did not play in 30 minutes, Mm -hmm. which is what the box says. Given the number of dice and the, the number of locations that you have to go to, during the course of the game. I don't understand how they're doing 30 minutes. Yeah. Period. But we were able to finish the game this time. Yay. And the new rules make much more sense. So basically, you start out with Frodo dice. And this is a whole bunch of custom dice. Each character has their own set of dice that all have different stuff on them. So we, you start out with a handful of Frodo dice, a couple of Sam dice. There are Sam dice and Bill dice. Bill is the pony oh. that you have to have access to purchase while you're still in the Shire. And then as long as you don't have any opponents to fight on Sauron's player mat, because there's also Sauron dice, then you can proceed to the next location, which is Rivendell, which is where the elves live. And then all of a sudden, the Fellowship of the Ring dice come in, and those go onto Sauron's card, and they get rolled, and you have to worry about him attacking. So then you're trying to 
roll your dice. You get to pull five dice out of your bag at a time and you roll them. And then you have either the character. So like Frodo is represented by a ring because he's the ring bearer. Sam is represented by a frying pan because <laughs> he cooks. And then on the other sides are, remember that I'm sure you saw uh, Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. The, you know, the little uh, pins that they pin their cloaks with. Right, right. Yes. Yeah. That has that symbol. And it's basically, I kept calling it Lemba spread. You know, it's basically your mana. <laughs> right. And so you have to spend these to put your characters into action. So Sam and Frodo each cost one Lemba spread, basically. <laughs> then when it comes towards the end of your turn, you look and see, okay, what does Sauron have? Can you attack any of those and take them down? And if the answer is yes, one of those dice gets destroyed and moved to the destroyed area on Sauron's map. You can't change locations again until you defeat all of Sauron's minions in the active area. Hmm. So if you get to the end of your turn and he's still got minions there, Sauron gets a, a corruption for each dice that's still there and, and then an extra corruption for each die that has a Sauron eye on it. And then what you do is you take that number of corruption and you look at the value of all of the different characters that are out on the table and you put you basically say like you have six corruption well boromir costs six to buy so you put a corruption on boromir if you anybody's using any boromir dice those dice are suddenly blank Oof. effectively so while while he's corrupted his dice are worth nothing oh. you can buy corruption off of a character by using your lemba spread your mana or you can decrease your your points, your victory points by that amount if you're the ring bearer. So it, it gets a little complicated. You go through these locations as you defeat Sauron's forces. You know, as you defeat all the forces, then you can move to the next location. Sauron gets all of his forces back for the next location. Maybe get some more added for the next location. When you finally get to Mount Doom, then it tells you to draw the next location, which is the, the place where the elves go at the end of the movie. Oh, right. Future Kathy here. The name of the last location is the Grey Havens. And it says, congratulations, you win. Yeah. It probably took us about an hour to an hour and a half to play this game. Maybe it'll go faster the next time we play now that we finally understand the <laughs> rules. I'm going to give this game about a three and a half. It gets the half because I really like the box organizer <laughs> and I like the artwork. But yeah, the the fact that we had to go find other rules to learn to play the game, that the ones that came in the box were no good. That just sounds like they didn't bother doing any blind play testing. The ones that came in the box, to me, they felt like they were written for people who have played Quarriers before. Probably was. Not written for somebody who had never played Quarriers before. In fact, there's one spot in the book that says, oh, Quarriers players, by the way, this is different Ugh. than what you're used to. That's terrible. It, I was just like, yeah, mm-mm. No, that was a bad, bad call. They needed to have this set up for people who haven't played Quarriers to learn how to play it. Right. It's a standalone game. You shouldn't rely on people who already know how to play a different game to play this one. Right. Yeah, I've played Quarriers. It was one of the earlier games that we got and I could not wrap my head around it. I think we played it because it was early on and I think we played it six or seven times. I didn't just not win a game. I did. I scored so terribly. And every single game we played a Quarriers, I just could not get that game. So we ended up trading it away. And every game that's been that kind of dice building game since then, I've looked at them and none of them have really made any improvements for the way my brain works. So, and that one sounds like it came out right after Quarriers. This one was interesting in that it's a cooperative game. That's true. That does make it different. There is a winner, whoever scores the most victory points. In this case, Mark and I tied. Hmm. But one of the things that we decided to do after our marathon session where we just gave up, <laughs> we were trying to play it two player. So this time when we pulled it out to play with the new rules, we decided to play it four player with just the two of us huh so we were each controlling two bags of dice ah uh, okay and we just took turns going back and forth and it was still a challenge to beat sauron mm -hmm. but it was doable uh, i see two player it was not doable 
Huh. There was no way that a two player, and they didn't scale anything down for two player. Yeah, that would be why. You were still going up against the same number of monsters, the same uh, issues. So, I mean, it, it was similar to Sam and Frodo trying to get the ring to Mount Doom without anybody else's help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not very feasible. Yeah. So eh, I think I might keep this around to try it a couple other times. I'd like to see how it plays with actual four players. Right. Maybe that will change it. I like the theme of it. I like the artwork of it. I think once we got it down, it was fun. Right. It's just the fact that we had to jump through hoops to be able to figure out the game. Yeah. Made it rate low for me. So that's Lord of the Rings, the dice building game from WizKids. With the rules in the box, WizKids, you owe me, th- you owe me and Mark three and a half hours each. <laughs> With the new rules from Board Game Geek, I'll give it a three and a half. Okay. That seems decent. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What's next for you? Well, this is going to come as some surprise to people, but Will and I actually got a chance to play Hanabi. This I want to hear about. Yes, this is an interesting one. So we were at Target over the weekend, and every now and then, I think it's about twice a year, Target does a clearance on their toys. And so, we, of course, we were looking at Lego, see if there's anything good. And I always glance at the board game wall just on the off chance there's something. Well, Hanabi was sitting there for $4. So I turned to Will, and I'm like, I'm kind of curious. And he's like, so am I. And I'm like, you think it's worth four bucks? And he says, I think the experience is worth four bucks. If we don't like it, we will find somebody else who will. So just in brief, Hanabi is designed by Antoine Bauza, published by Asmodee, all the way back in 2010. How it's played, and this is why this is an odd choice for us, is it there's five different colors of cards. Yes, it is color based. Each color has the numbers one through five. And what you're trying to do is get the colors in rows in the correct order from one to five. The challenge is you hold your card so that the other players see them. You can never actually see your own cards. And so on your turn, you're trying to help tell other people what kind of cards they have, but you're very limited on your communication. You can only tell them which cards are which color Or which cards are which number. So you can say you have uh, two green cards and you point to which ones are green. Or you can say you have have one, uh, a three, three card and you point to it. But you have to balance because you can't just freely give this information. You have these time tokens. I guess I should back up. The theme, for as much as there is a theme, is putting on fireworks. Except you've kind of done it all kind of badly. And so you're running out of time to try to put this thing on. And so you've got time tokens. When you want to give information, you have to use a time token. But if you're out of time tokens, you can't give information. You have to either play a card or discard. And you can safely discard sort of, but there's only so many numbers, so many copies of each number. So if there's only two fours in whatever color, and you happen to discard both fours, well, that means that color will only be able to go up to three. You'll never be able to play a five. But if you try to play and you play a card that can't go on, like you play a red four, but there's only a red two, you start the fireworks accidentally, but you've got three tries. Well, technically you have two tries because on the third miss, it blows up and you all fail. So it is cooperative. And so you can win by actually completing all five colors, one through five, Or if you can get to the end of the deck without blowing up, you count how many points you've actually gotten, and then you get kind of a rating of how well the audience liked or didn't like your display. So this is very, very difficult for someone who is legally blind, which Will is. So how we overcame this was in a two-player game, each player only gets three cards. So I placed my cards face down on the table, so there was left, middle, and right. And when he would want to look at my cards, he'd pick up one of them, so we're, we're playing in the living room. He would get up, go into the office. He has something called a closed circuit television, which is basically a giant magnifier, computerized, so he can zoom in and out and f- mess with the colors and contrast and stuff. So he'd go in there. Now, thankfully, they did put a symbol for the color. It's the Chinese characters under the number, which most people ignore. Now, we don't really have a great frame of reference for Chinese characters, but Will was able to 
identify the differences between them and learn that this shape is blue and this shape is green and so on. So he was able to tell the color and the number because the number is large enough in the upper left hand corner. And then below it is the Chinese character for the color because the middle of the card is a burst that they do look different. And so someone who's just colorblind would do fine. But Will also has a vision disability. He couldn't tell them apart. So he would come back and he'd put the card back where it was and we'd play. What really fell apart for us while that was kind of cumbersome and it slowed down the memory aspect for me, which I don't have a great memory to start with, we actually found that we communicate very differently. I communicate via colors and he communicates via numbers. And so he was trying to give me number clues that didn't make any sense to me. And I was trying to give him color clues that didn't make any sense to him. And so it fell apart and we blew ourselves up. (laughs) That was an interesting experience. We learned a lot about ourselves and we wanted to play it mostly because of our game design. We wanted to know, you know, why did it win the Spiel des Jahres and why is it so popular? And so we got that and we're good. We'll, we'll just end on a high note of blowing ourselves up. And we do have friends that we're going to uh, meet this weekend. And I think it'll work much better for them. So I don't think the experience was completely wasted because we did approach it more from a game design experience of a, what is the game design experience so we can learn from it. We may never, ever build a game like it, but it enters our repertoire of understanding of mechanisms. So I give it a two. It is not a complete waste of time. I do not want to play it again. Mark and I played this game at Board Game BlitzCon. Yeah. And rather than cards, they had tiles. Yes, I saw that. It's a deluxe version. Yeah. Tiles were really nice. It was a really nice set. I could not get this game. (laughs) It's not easy. I had bought it at the flea market with the intent of coming home and playing it. So I have the card version. But one of the people there said, oh, I have the game. Why don't we sit down? I'll teach you how to play. And then... It was so funny because every time I made a move, she's she'd look at me like, why on earth did you do that? That was stupid. I mean, she didn't say that, but that right. was like the look on her face. And I was like, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't, I'm trying to figure it out, but I, I'm not getting it. Yeah, we walked away from that game going, yeah, that was plenty. Yeah. Did you find a good home for that copy that you bought? Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Not yet. It'll probably be in the next flea market. (laughs) So yeah, so that's uh, how you play Hanabi with a mostly blind guy. (laughs) (laughs) That's an experience. It is. And I will have to say my own faults. I have a terrible memory. So it was not a good combination. All right. We know to keep you two away from uh, the fireworks at 4th of July, too. (laughs) Yes, that too. All right. My last game that I'm going to talk about has quite literally become an obsession. Oh. Yeah. Apparently, Asmodee Digital had a sale recently, and I got the Onirim app for free. Nice. I actually paid for it. Yeah. I have not been able to stop (laughs) playing this game. (laughs) That's awesome. If I'm waiting in line at the grocery store, I'm playing Onirim. If I'm waiting for water to boil on the stove, I'm playing Onirim. If I'm waiting for podcasts to finish processing something, I'm playing Onirim. Now, wait a minute. I've heard it. I thought it was Onirim. Is the emphasis not on the first I? I've heard it called Onirim. I've heard it called Onirim. Okay. So it's one of those potato potato things. Okay. I think so. Okay. So this was designed by Shadi Torbay and published by Z-Man Games, and the app is published by Asmodee Digital. Originally, the tabletop game came out in 2010, and yeah, I am just, this is a solo-only game. It was designed as a solo, solitaire game, and basically you are locked in a dream maze and trying to find your way out, and in the base game, there are eight doors that you have to unlock. There are symbols on the cards that... The artwork on the cards is pretty, but they doesn't yeah. contribute much. But it's the symbols in, in the upper corner that you want to pay attention to. There are suns, moons, keys... That's it for the base game. Yeah, that's it for the base game. Suns, moves, and keys. There is an expansion, which I, of course, got that adds spirals. The keys can be used to either unlock a door. So if a door card comes up and you have that color key in your hand, then you can unlock it and it it goes into the uh, doors area and shows that it's unlocked. The keys can also be used to get a prophecy which basically allows you to look at the top five cards of the draw pile and you get to put them back in whatever order you want and the fifth one gets discarded. So 
there are nightmare cards in the deck. And if you pull up a nightmare card, then you're ha- going to have to discard something. But if you use a key to get a prophecy and there's a nightmare card there, you can make that the discard and get rid of it. When the nightmare cards come up into your hand, you have some choices. If you have a key in your hand, you can use your key to get rid of the nightmare. If you don't like the cards that are in your hand, you can discard your hand of cards and that gets rid of the nightmare. Or if you like the cards that are in your hand and you're planning a play with the cards that are in your hand, your other option is to discard the top five cards of the discard pile. But you've only got a set amount of cards. And if you run out of cards before you've unlocked all the doors, then you lose. So I have a 32% win rate. (laughs) That's a lot better than mine. I think mine's 8% win rate. (laughs) I'm terrible at this game. I'm struggling to enjoy it, but I do enjoy it. It's just it it beats me over the head more often than not. (laughs) Yeah, when I got the uh, expansion that added the spiral symbol, Mm -hmm. it also added, I want to say one more door each. Yeah, it adds three doors of each color that you have to unlock. But the spirals have a special ability in that when you discard a spiral, you get to look at the top five cards of the deck. And if one of them is a door, you unlock that door. Regardless of color. And then you take the remaining four cards and they go at the bottom of the deck, which kind of messes me up sometimes because I forget that. (laughs) Yes, yes. I don't know what it is about this game, but it just it's it's captured my imagination. It's captured my interest. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with it. Mark and I are c- comparing scores all the time. This morning, I managed to up my score over 6,500. Nice. Yeah. So I'm having a lot of fun with it. I give it a five. Buy it, buy it now. If you enjoy solitaire games at all, this is a good one. And I'm seriously considering buying the tabletop version so I can show my mom who loves to play solitaire if you do buy the tabletop version make sure to buy the really nice version that has the seven expansions included i'm currently borrowing that from ben and it's a really nice box set even comes with a very useless wooden token that's shaped like a nightmare but it's just a really nice presentation of the box plus it has all seven expansions so you can find older versions of it that just have it or maybe one or two expansions but if you just want to get it all and here's one more thing to think about the card version can be played with two players will and i have tried it didn't care too much for it but will didn't like the gameplay at all so i don't know if that was more contributing to why we didn't like it so you and mark could try the two-player variant to see if you do like playing it together the other thing i was thinking about doing was just introducing the app to my mom oh, there because you go. it does it does a lot of the work for you that's very true i know a lot of people haven't gone back to their card version because you have to shuffle so much yeah when you're playing the tabletop version whereas the app it does it all for you and i know my mom plays some games on on her phone so this one might be one that she would like and i know she likes solitaire games so yeah that's a good choice might introduce this one to her that's all that i've got anything else from you Nope, that's actually covered most everything we've played recently. All right, so we do have a little bit of news that we want to share. We're sorry to say that two members of our team have decided to move on. Their life has taken some twists and turns for them, and they need to prioritize. So unfortunately, both Jessica and Carrie uh, have to step away from the show for right now, but... They are doing so because, like I said, life has taken some twists and turns for each of them. And we have told them that they will be missed. Mm, That's for sure. And we have also told them that they are welcome to come back at any time. Just give us a heads up. And we want to wish them the best of luck on their future endeavors. Sure, sure. Yep. And anyway, other than that, that's what we've been playing. You've heard us referring to and rating games by a rating scale. Here's how we're using this scale. 1. Give me back the time I spent playing it. 2. Has great potential as kindling. 3. Decent with some bugs. 4. A good solid game. And 5. Buy this, buy this now. Today for the interview, I'm joined by Tanya DePass. Tanya is the founder and director of 
I Need Diverse Games, which is a nonprofit that works to expand diversity in all aspects of gaming. Tanya is also the host of the Fresh Out of Tokens podcast. Tanya, welcome to our turn. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Kathy. I wanted to tell you I I am a big fan of uh, following you on Twitter. Uh, I love your tweet storms. You always make such great points with with your posts. Oh, thank you so much. A lot of times, well, it, it's kind of funny because a lot of times those tweet storms come out of stuff I've seen on my timeline, mm-hmm. but I don't want to be that person that like yells at a particular person, but it's the overall topic that I feel very strongly about. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times it's, it just kind of, that's the fuel for me and I get on a tangent and, you know, People like what I have to say, so yay. (laughs) So for those that don't know, because there are still a lot of people not on Twitter for some reason, Twitter has a 140 character limit on posts. So uh, if you have a lot to say about something, Twitter uh, limits you on how much you can put in there. So a tweet storm is a series of posts that follow one another and it talk about, uh, you know, any particular topic. And from what I've seen, Tanya is a master at these. Once I learned to thread my tweets, yes, <laughs> for a long time, I had no idea how to do that. And I'm just like, why are people replying to this one random tweet? Oh, because I didn't like them. So tell me about I Need Diverse Games. What inspired you to start it? And what kind of work do you do with that? So for those folks that don't know, I literally was mad about video games at six in the morning, as one does. In October 2014, it It was that time of year, and it came around again because of the whole, it's too hard to animate women, and we were inches from a playable female character, you know, for Ubisoft games, and I was annoyed. And when I get annoyed, I talk a lot. So I I just talked a bit about how I'm tired of games being full of just the same scruffy white dude protagonist, you know, the brown hair, blue, green, gray eyed dude who's got the terrible life story and... You know, the girlfriend, wife, daughter, whoever dies for his man pain. And I got, I'm very tired of that narrative. And so I was tweeting about that and I added on the hashtag, I need diverse games. My friend, Mickey Kendall, Carnethia, retweeted that. And when someone with 30,000 Twitter followers tweets you, um, (laughs) a lot of people see that. And it actually was trending for a couple of days. But unfortunately, with the trending hashtag comes the not so pleasant side of things. And between that, like, almost six in the morning Twitter patient and getting to work and settling in for the day, I got a call from Mickey advising me to get a bunch of block bots because the unsavory corners of the internet had found the hashtag. And I'm ordinary. And the more that people tell me not to do something, I do it more. Thing intensifies, as, as the meme says. And I, you know, kept talking about it, kept tagging more tweets with, with the hashtag, other folks like industry, other gamers, and it became a conversation. And from there, I gave it its own Twitter handle because it was kind of eating my Twitter alive. At that point, I started a blog and a community grew out of it. And it's a lot of it was right place, right time. People were in that mode to hear it and to have the conversation. And, you know, I was getting some public, some, uh, some eyes on it. Geek Girl Con that year had kind of an impromptu panel about it. I got interviewed, I went on podcasts. And so all of this grew into, we want to have this going and became a nonprofit eventually. So actually last year, last August became a 501c3 nonprofit. And what we do is we do things like we help people go to GDC, the Game Developers Conference every year. We're part of that program that gives 25 passes and it's up to our discretion uh, how we want to administer it. We do things like go to the PAX um, Diversity Lounge. In exchange for some volunteer hours, people can get a pass to PAX. What we try to do is sponsor events. So we we sponsor 10 tickets to Game Developers Conference, which just happened in New York a couple weeks ago. Things like VectorConf. And so we're trying to enable access to these events because a lot of what happens and why people don't get to do things and don't get a chance to have their work seen is, is literal access to events like that. Because, you know, while PAX is more of a consumer-driven thing, it's still a chance to go and talk to people. It's still a chance to, you know, if you're an indie developer, have a spot in the indie alley. So we're just trying to enable people to to get to places and, you know, have a chance to network, have a chance to be seen. Because a lot of these events are still super white. They're super male-dominated. Uh, a lot of places, people don't feel comfortable being out if they are queer on the queer spectrum. 
of whatever letter you fall under or mix of letters. So what we're trying to do is just give people that access. And whether it's monetary support, just a ticket to an event, that's what we're trying to do. And, you know, we've got the blog, we take community articles, we have the podcast, there's a Tumblr, there's Twitter, and we try to share things that we see in the community. So a lot of it is giving that voice to people who normally don't get seen. And that's where a lot of the issues in diversity and lack thereof come from. That's just incredible that you're doing that and helping so many people out. Uh, besides the ones you just mentioned, what kind of uh, events do you go to? I usually go to, well, I'm part of GamerX. So I'm actually the diversity liaison for GamerX, which is now its own 501c3, which just uh, happened the other day. So they reached out to me and were like, hey, we got feedback at our event that there's not a lot of people of color. Can you help us with that? So I'm now staffed with GamerX. I go to PAX. I've not gone to PAX South yet because it just didn't work out so far. I try to go to smaller things and not just PAX, not just big things like GDC. I was a guest of honor at a lot of things earlier in the year. I got a chance to go to Australia. And, you know, even if I can't physically go there, I try to support people who can. So VectorConf, AlterConf, because I always want to say call AlterConference, um, but AlterConf is a thing that Ash Dryden runs. And... Everything is about giving people a chance to to give talks, especially if you've never given a talk, and giving people of color and marginalized folks a chance to be out there, be seen, have a chance to talk about issues that are important to them. And UltraConf was just in Chicago. It's doing some international travel soon. There's so many things. I'm trying to support FlameCon. I want to support HavenCon. I'm involved with Universal FanCon. We're an affiliate for that. The first uh, Universal FanCon will be next year in April. We're at AnyKey Affiliate. AnyKey is another 501c3 organization dedicated to diversity in gaming. A lot of their focus is on women, non-binary folks in gaming, and getting folks out there, getting them seen. They've got a stream team. They go to a lot of conventions as well. C2E2, which is here in Chicago, not doing Wizard World this year. I'll be at Gen Con for the first time in August. I'm an industry insider for the first time. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. So it's it's interesting. I got a chance to go to OrcaCon. I'm helping them with programming as well. And um, Donna Pryor started that. It's focused on tabletop and diversity. So anyone who is truly interested in doing the work, I want to help support them because I'm not the only person talking about this. I'm not the first. I won't be the last. And I, there's a lot of work to be done still, no matter how many people are involved. So as many things as I can feasibly get to without bankrupting myself or just spreading myself too thin, I'm going to be at. Fantastic. You're really busy. Yeah, I uh, I wasn't home all of this April. Yeah. <laughs> so you recently announced that you have a big project going on. You want to tell me about that? Yes. So I am editing an anthology and submissions are still open. They'll be open for about a month by the time this airs. So for anyone who read Women in Game Development, Breaking the Glass Level Cap, edited by Jennifer Brandis Hepler. It's designed to be a follow-up, and it's the same publisher. And Jennifer actually reached out and said, hey, you know, they asked me about this. I think the next logical step is to tell stories of marginalized people, but this isn't my this isn't my lane. So would you be interested in doing it? And it was kind of, I ran around in circles because A, I'm a big Dragon Age nerd, and Jennifer Hepler asked me to do this. And then, you know, it was a chance to to further tell people's stories and give people a chance to, to talk about the intersections of their identity and how it has affected them in the industry. So CRC Press is, is the publisher. The call for submissions is out there. And ideally, if someone is listening and they're in the industry, and by the industry, I also do mean tabletop, because I've gotten that question several times. You know, if you are someone who is marginalized, be it queer, female, person of color, intersections of all those, neurodivergent, non-binary, and you have a story to tell about how your identity slash identities has affected your work, your place in the industry, what you've created, then that is a personal essay I would love to have. Industry essays will be paid. And once we close things on August 15th, I'll be going through things. That very long-winded story is I want to tell the stories of people in the industry who don't get a voice. And this would be in a book format versus the podcast or by streaming or something. So for those listening, if you think you would be interested in submitting a story, go to cypheroftear.com backslash margins antho. And there's an FAQ on the page. All the submission info is there. 
And the email, if you have questions, is marginsantho at gmail.com. So if you're unsure about submitting something, if you want to maybe know what the pay rate is or kind of what the timeline is, things that are not publicly out there yet, because you know, like as we get closer to actually submitting and editing essays, that'll that'll be more public. Then drop me a line at Margins Antho. I'll actually be home until Gen Con, so I can give you a quick answer, hopefully. Because <laughs> we know how email works. It's immediate, but you don't always get an immediate answer. But I, that's the story that I would love to tell. Um, and people that are adjacent to the industry are welcome to submit as well. The pay rate won't be as good because that actually will come out of I Need Diverse Games for those that are in the industry CRC Press is paying. So right now I'm talking to a couple artists about uh, cover ideas because I do have input on the cover. I don't have input on the internal art so much unless people submit like screenshots or their own property. And the ideas have like 18 to 22, 24 stories in a book that can be accessed by everyone. It's not going to be academic jargon. It's not going to be, you know, industry jargon, hopefully. So if you're listening, please don't make your essay a bunch of industry jargon. <laughs> I want this to be accessible to anyone p- to pick it up and read and, and realize that these stories are A, important, B, they have value, and C, that, you know, I want someone to pick this up and read it and go, I too could be in the industry. I don't want people to read it and take away, oh, the industry is terrible. I'll never, ever go into it. Because that's always a fear of, you know, like, personal essays can be hard. Personal essays can be very difficult to write and to read. And I don't want to actively discourage anyone from going into the industry, but I'm a realist and I would like people to know that it can be hard, but at the end of the day, these people are in the industry, or maybe they left. Maybe that winds up being a story that's told. But here's why, you know? Wow, this is all very important work. One of the reasons that I started Our Turn is because I was listening to a lot of podcasts and not hearing a lot of female voices. I didn't see any female leadership of podcasts. And so it finally occurred to me that if I wanted to see it, I had to be it. But Mm-mm. getting exposure is also difficult. We were lucky enough to be able to join the Dice Tower Network, which gave us a lot of exposure, but not everybody has that option. So the work you're doing is really important to helping those who are marginalized get exposed. Yeah. So this is a story, a short one, but a lot of it comes down to seeing people like you. And the first time I went to Game Developers Conference... I was there with a friend. I had no interest in joining the industry. I was there because a friend wanted to get in the industry as an artist. She wanted someone with her, so she was not just kind of out there by herself. And even then, I noticed these are all the same dudes. Like, there's not a lot of people who look like me. There's not a lot of women. Because in 2014, pre-the dark times upon us in gaming, it still was a very white thing. And it's still a very white event. But as I've continued to go back, now as part of the industry, it's improving. It's slow, but it's getting there. And the story part of this is doing GamerX 4. Prior to a panel I was on, there were some folks who saw me, and they emphasized how important it was and how meaningful it was to see someone like them on a panel. Because how many times do we go to panels and it's all dudes, it's all white dudes, it's always the same people telling the same stories and getting kudos for for doing the bare minimum. You know, doing the basic thing that you should do anyway. And it's like, oh my God, they're so, they're so aware. They're so awesome. And so seeing that at an event that is at the intersection of me for my race and my queerness and having someone feel like they could be there because they saw someone like them just sitting on a panel. Because for me, I do this all the time. Panels are work. They are, it's not, the thrill of it is not as, is like, oh my God, I get to go do a panel. But that was very powerful because you don't think about it. You don't think about, you know, I'm sitting here talking about something I talk about all the time. It's 90 minutes out of my day at this con, but you're not thinking about maybe the person in the audience who's never seen a black person on a panel, not talking about diversity or not talking about, oh, I'm a woman in the industry. It's so terrible. So that's what I think we have to keep in mind. You know, if you are in a position of privilege, be it monetary privilege, privilege to be a guest at these things, or if someone asks you for your opinion, et cetera, think about your place in this. Think about, am I the person who should be highlighted once again? You know, if if you're a white person asked about diversity, it's like, well, should, should I really be on this panel? 
or am I talking about it as I'm a white person talking to another white person about their privilege and why they should think about it? And that visibility, that access, and that importance of seeing yourself reflected is something that, you know, there's not a lot of words you can really use, and we use the same tired tropes. We use the same, you know, our own voices and diversity and inclusion and, and you know, seeing yourself, which is all great, but there's no language for that feeling that first time, seeing someone like you succeeding at what you want to do, or seeing someone talk about the things that you're passionate about after con after con of never seeing yourself reflected in not just who's attending, but who's on stage. Yeah, that's very important to be a person that sets the example f- for others. You know, speaking as a woman, I think it's very important that women see other women in gaming, not only as players, but also as people who work in the industry, who review the industry and all of that. So thank you for the work you're doing. You're doing it from a slightly different angle than I am, different perspective entirely. I applaud you for the work that you're doing. Thank you. And I, I think it's important too to, to note that a lot of times people are doing the work, but we don't see them because either they can get more done behind the scenes and they're not in it to get the accolades or not in it to get the kudos for look at me, I did this thing, I fight for diversity. Or, you know, look at me, aren't I awesome? And, you know, that's when we talk about doing stuff for ally cookies. Or just the sheer fact of trying to talk about diversity gets you a lot of harassment, which is really sad. Yeah. Or even just simply talking about your experiences as a marginalized person, whatever your axis of marginalization is, is that, you know, you can't and I I don't even want to say can't, it's difficult to A, have a nuanced conversation B, it's it's hard because for every person who goes, I finally see someone talking about something I have felt and I've known, you get 10 other people that want to be in their feelings and go, but what about white people? What about men? What about white men especially? And you're just like, I'm having, I'm, I'm talking about my experience here. Right. This is not you. And that puts a lot of people off from like, I'm going to go do my thing. But I'm not going to talk about it because, one, you'll look like you're looking for ally cookies even if you're not. And for two, we just can't have a nuanced conversation in public spaces, which, you know, is really sad because a lot of the great conversations I've had have sprung from things said on a panel, followed up on Twitter, etc. But right now we are not in a place to do that. Yeah, and that that's really frustrating. Incredibly so. I mean, you follow me on Twitter, you see the stuff I talk about. And you know, I'll use something that recently happened as an example, if I may. Sure. So I saw I saw someone talking about watchdogs and, and being reminded that they're black and police brutality. And, you know, I've told Ubisoft this that I am not a fan of the first game. I, I literally took it back the next day after I bought it. Watch Dogs 2, however, has a special place in my heart because not only did they fix a lot of things wrong in the first game. They acknowledged the microaggressions of being a black dude in Silicon Valley, of all the things that happen. You know, you're a young black dude. You're literally set up by the cops. That is your plot. And it bugged me because it showed the fact that you are playing this game, you as a non-black person, and you can't understand why these are important. The same with Mafia 3. I love this game. I know the protagonist is a is a murderer. He's getting revenge. It's a revenge story. I know this. However, how often do we get to see black dudes have that story? Right. So, you know, all of these nuanced things that are finally in games, and yes, they address the racism, they address all the things that are going on, but this idea that even mentioning race when you've already got a black protagonist, so it's right there, is unnecessary. You are forcing the player to confront this. Well, I have news for you. I have to confront this literally every day of my life. I don't get to opt out of this. I don't get to opt out of waking up to see a hashtag that, you know, from another person murdered by the cops. I don't get to opt out of the terrible things that people will say about someone who's been murdered and posthumously trying to blame them for their own death. And so in discussing these things about games, because we, when it comes to race and games and race in games, we're even further behind the conversation about gender or LGBT issues. And... No, it talked about the fact that the world does not let me forget that I'm black. For those that don't know what I look like, find me on Twitter. It's my, actually my photo. And someone chimes in with, I don't mean to derail, but the world doesn't let me forget that I'm white either. <laughs> okay. And then they continued. I mean, and granted, I, you know, I, I think there's other issues at play. But they continued on with, 
they even pulled out the Irish trope of I'm Irish and oppressed. And they literally could not let go of the fact that I've got issues too. I'm oppressed. And it was, but the thing is, you as a, presumably as a white dude, as in their replies, you've got a level of privilege, privilege that is separate from whatever your economic status is. There are things that are going to be open for you that are never going to be open for me. And the very fact that I said, I'm not talking about you, no one asked you, and you are still derailing by, by dint of your very reply, they went into a whole spiral about showing me that I'm worthless and that I have no value. And I was like, who said that? No one here said that. But you are butting into a conversation that has nothing to do with you. And that is the kind of stuff that you will see all the time. Or you get, you know, you're racist. And I'm like, please explain how this works to me, <laughs> how I can be a racist, please. And then it turns into a thing and I wind up adding more people to my block list. But, you know, those are the kind of things where we can't have nuanced discussion. And, you know, saw a thread earlier about someone, someone's going out about the games as art discussion. And, you know, right now I would not say games are art because people can't have adult conversations about what games mean. And that's tabletop, that's video games, that's... LARP. There's too many disparate things to try to have a discussion about what games mean and are they art and, and that old saw that never, ever go away, I think. Right. I saw in one of your recent tweet storms where you were talking about diversity in games and mm -hmm. you brought up diversity in fantasy games, whether role playing mm -hmm. or tabletop or video games. And it made me realize, yeah, why can't we have, you know, Asians and Africans depicted in games? You know, why can't a fantasy game take take place in Africa or on the Indian subcontinent or wherever? Why do they always have to take place in medieval Europe? Yeah. And uh, medieval POC, who talks a lot about people of color in medieval art history, was, you know, is often referenced a lot. And, you know, my biggest gripe with fantasy games and their whole but historical accuracy, I was like, well, dragons didn't actually exist. <laughs> Nor elves or fairies. Or dwarves or orcs. Mm -hmm. So you are willing to accept that line of, of plausible deniability about reality and accuracy, but brown people are a step too far. Because the fantasy stuff is made up whole cloth. No one I know, and I doubt anyone listening to this, knows someone who's actually met a dragon, met an elf. You know, Lord of the Rings is fantasy. So there's just a lot of... But historical accuracy, that's the argument I always get when it comes when it when it comes down to The Witcher. I love The Witcher 3. It is one of the best written games I have played in many, many years. And it is a beautiful game. I mean, they've even got physics for a girl's hair to grow back as after you get him a haircut. <laughs> so this is a, a great game, but whenever I bring it up, I always get but Polish mythology, and I'm like well, show me where the Scottish accented dwarves are in Scottish or in Polish mythology. Show me where the Griffins come in because I need to know. There was a game that came out that all of the characters were female. It was a tabletop game, and I'm blanking on the name of it. Future Kathy here. The name of the game was One Deck Dungeon. There was a post on I think Amazon, a review of it that where a, a woman said, I won't buy this game because my sons will never play it because there are no male characters. Oh, poor them. How often have women been required to, you know, when you're playing a game, there's no female characters, or maybe there's one, but you've got three women sitting at the table. You know, somebody's going to end up having to play a male character. And why is that okay? But having all female characters is not okay. Or having, you know, a cast of characters of all people of color. Why is that not okay? Well, I mean, we, I, we probably don't have enough time in this interview. <laughs> why the real issue is, but um, I was actually talking with someone earlier today, and I call it Gamer Manifest Destiny. And a lot of it, I think, comes down to, you know, those of us of a certain age remember when being a nerd and a geek and a gamer was not cool. Uh -huh. um, you know, Revenge of the Nerds was out. It, you know, it just wasn't something you did. And, you know, for me, as someone who's black, grew up on the south side of the city, there's the additional layer of black folks don't do that, that, you know, some people erroneously believe. And so because these folks were in their enclaves and, in, and with their buddies, and they were playing D&D &D just with other, like, white dudes, they never saw the folks like me or my friends that are now writing their own tabletop modules 
that were just as hardcore about it, you know, met every week, did did all the stuff, played D&D since Redbox, and, you know, they were persecuted for being a nerd. I was persecuted for being a nerd in high school, but we're not in high school anymore. Mm-hmm. We are all grown-ups, and being a nerd is mainstream. Look at look at how conventions have grown, where before it was something, you know, only the really well-off nerds could do because they were always some far away place and cost a lot of money and hotel, etc. So, But now... Being a gamer is mainstream. You, you know, you'll see people walking around with all sorts of merchandise and no one thinks about it. It's, you know, everybody's got either a console, the game on their computer, the game on their phone. So they are no longer this faux oppressed minority that wants to act as if the world is against them because they like to play video games or whatever it is they like to do. And so seeing that their hobby is now not this enclave and the, their own little safe space that they thought it was because they're wrong. We were always there. Now they want to lash out and now they want to act like we're invading. We suddenly found gaming. We suddenly found tabletop or movies whole cloth. And it's like, dude, we've been here. The fact that you don't want to pay attention and see that there's other people in this hobby, that's on you. So they, they've had this feeling of manifest destiny. Gaming is mine. I survey it. And these interlopers need to leave. And that's how we wind up with the dark corners of the internet that I'm not going to name because invoking their name brings them out like Candyman. But that's that's how we get there. And sorry, y'all, but being a gamer is not unique anymore. People have whole careers off being gamers. I mean, look at Twitch. Look at all the other things mm-hmm. that people do based on gaming as as something that is not just a fun hobby to do when you come home and you're tired of your day job. This is your work, like playing games, being entertaining, being on, that is your day gig. So that that's where I think a lot of this comes from is my enclave, my space is no longer the little den of, of weirdos, misfits, and geeks that it was when I was a teenager. I never got over that. And now I'm going to be mad. And I'm going to take that out on someone who dares disagree with me and remind me of this fact. Just wow. I appreciate you coming on the show to talk about these issues. Oh, no problem. It, luckily, I can kind of rein myself in because I realize I will soapbox very easily, especially, <laughs> you know, it, with a chance to like have an audience or on a panel. And, you know, I try to reel myself in. So apologies if I ranted a bit. That's okay. That's just fine. How can people get a hold of you if they want to chat with you? Okay, so if you want to talk business, such as uh, diversity consulting for your game or your project, best way is Tanya, T-A-N-Y-A, at INeedDiverseGames.org. That email will get to me pretty quickly. If you want to just follow my personal Twitter, that's Cypher of Tear, C-Y-P-H-E-R-O-F-T-Y-R. The Twitter for I Need Diverse Games is I Need D-I-V-G-M-S. Because unfortunately, I Need Diverse Games would not all fit in one handle. And our site is INeedDiverseGames.org. We are on um, Patreon because that is our only funding right now. So it's patreon.com backslash I need D-I-V-G-M-S. I've got a personal Patreon, which allows me to keep doing what I do without a day job. And so that's patreon.com backslash Cypher of Tear. And if you have a general inquiry and not something specific for me, INDG at I need diverse games will get to me and it is a shared mailbox. So if you have a business inquiry or something like that, Tanya at I need diverse games should be the email you use. And... You know, we're out there, we're on Twitter, we're on Twitch, Tumblr, Facebook, Instagram, although I'm terrible at using our Instagram account. Don't follow me there because I'm, I'm very bad at it. Well, we will include all of those in the show notes for this episode. So thank you again for coming on, Tanya, and I hope you'll come back and let us know how your anthology project goes. Definitely. And for those listening that may want to submit, um, and the submissions close August 15th, 2017. So look at the show notes. If you have questions, drop me a line. If not, I hope to get submissions from you. Great. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me on. Hey, everyone. This is Sarah. If you're curious on how you can support the show, here are some ideas. If you'd like to support us financially, you can support us through Patreon at www.patreon.com slash our turn podcast we've switched from pay per episode to pay per month we also have a donation button on the site for anyone wanting to do a one-time donation we have a lot of plans to improve our audio and expand the content we provide but we need help to do so 
However, we totally understand that not everyone has the funds to support us. Thankfully, there are many non-monetary and important ways to help us. Tell a friend about the show. Really, one of the best ways to support us is to spread the word to people you know. Commenting on our posts, either on the website, Facebook, Twitter, or the Board Game Geek Guild, are very helpful for us to know what listeners think and want from our show. If you think of anyone you'd like us to interview, please let us know. We'd also appreciate any shares of our posts on social media. Take pics of you playing games and post them to any of our social media avenues. We'd love to know what you're playing and maybe take a look at playing those games too. Please call our voicemail number at 916-426-2873 and leave a message or a show intro or promo. For example, you could say, This is Sarah, and it's our turn. Or, this is Sarah, and you're listening to Our Turn Women on Gaming. Of course, replace Sarah with your name. So there's many ways to support us, and we'd appreciate any and all of them. Thanks for listening. And so now we're getting into the hot topic of the show. And we are joined today by Jesse Metcalf, our RPG reviewer and contributor. Jesse, welcome to the show. Uh, Thank you for having me. And Sarah is here, of course, as well. And today we are talking about two player games. Now, we don't mean necessarily two player only games. These can be games that could play more than two players, but they play two players really well. And so that's the premise that we're proceeding from. So Sarah, why don't you go ahead and start us off with your first game that plays two players well? Well, uh, first of all, as most of you should know by now, most of my gaming is Will and me. So it was hard to figure out where to start because all of our games are learned with me and Will, and then we might teach them to other people. So it was really hard to you know, reduce the list down. So I decided to go ahead and pick what my favorite two player only game is. And then then the other one I'll talk about will be my favorite two player variant because a lot of games change the rules for how two player works. But that'll be later. So first off, my favorite two player only game is Fallen. Fallen was designed by Tom Green and Stephen Smith, uh, published by Watchtower Games in 2014. It plays in about 90 minutes. One player chooses a hero to delve deep within a dungeon, seeking the ultimate evil that waits below. So the second player, of course, takes on the role of that dungeon lord, summoning vile creatures and ancient spells to defeat the hero. It's kind of a choose-your-own-adventure where the dungeon lord reads story cards, which include options for the hero to choose from. And once the hero makes a choice, there's an encounter where the hero and the dungeon lord face off. Each hero has special skills and abilities that can be improved over the course of the game. Likewise, the dungeon lords have their unique special abilities and groups of minions that can be improved over the course of the game. During the encounter, each player makes choices on what to use, which determines their dice. Then both players roll, and the outcome is determined. Both players will gain something, but the winner will gain a better reward. So this will go on for several encounters until the final face-off, where the hero has finally found the dungeon lord, and they battle to see who wins the day. So this is my favorite two-player-only game because it simulates a role-playing-like experience, well, for two players, which is really hard to find in an actual role-playing system. The game just works so well because of the unique story cards that brings the dungeon of Fallen to life. These cards deliver an immersive dungeon experience with deep mechanics to keep the players on their toes. And it's actually kind of a brain burner and it's just a real meaty experience. I've actually felt exhausted after playing. Like I was actually the one running through a dungeon swinging a sword. It's just a very intense experience. But sadly, I try not to talk about it too much because it's one of those sad Kickstarter success stories. The game is great. The Kickstarter made a lot of money. But the designers chose to make almost half of the gameplay content Kickstarter exclusive. So even though the retail version has a lot of content in it that you'd you'd still have to play a lot to exhaust, it just soured people who found out about it after the campaign. To make matters worse, when he tried to come out with two full expansions later after the Kickstarter was over, they were severely delayed and they had problems fulfilling it. 
So I don't even know how widely available those two expansions are. I pre-ordered or will pre-ordered for me as a gift. So I have them, but I don't know how available they are. So I'm happy I own it because I have all of it, but I'm sad that this could have been a very popular two-player game. I rate it a solid four out of five. I rate it higher, but it does take a lot of effort and time for us to play. So it just doesn't hit the table very often. But when we do play it, it's amazing. Cool. I hadn't heard of this one. Yeah, it's kind of a sleeper hit. And from what little research I was doing, it's not very available. And it's there's a few copies on the Board Game Geek store, but they're pretty expensive. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it just had some Kickstarter related issues and that's why it hasn't caught on right and then i don't think the company even exists anymore i know they had some financial issues afterwards with those two expansions because they had so many problems fulfilling it i I don't even i don't even know if the designer's doing anything else well that's too bad all right jesse what have you got for us it was really hard to find a couple of games to talk about mainly because i do a lot of two-player gaming uh both with friends and wife uh so i'm going to talk about the one that is probably my wife and i's favorite game as the Catan card game designed by klaus tuber and published by mayfair games it was published in 1996. sadly you can't find the Catan card game as it is now well, maybe not sadly. I think they did make some improvements. They re-implemented it as Rivals of Catan and released it in 2010. It has a passing resemblance to Catan in that you're still collecting resources, you're still building villages and cities, uh, and you're still connecting them via roads, but it's no longer on a map. You have a bunch of square-shaped uh, cards. Uh, you keep track of resources by rotating these square-shaped cards. So they have a 0, 1, 2, and 3 in each of them, and they max out at 3, so you can't uh, collect too many resources unless you get a second card of that resource. All of these resource tiles have a number 1 through 6. Uh, you're going to roll two dice, one with just numbers on it, and that'll tell you what resource is generated. And the other one's an event die that's going to generate bonus resource for certain people, whether they have more knights or military power, or if they have more windmill points, uh, which is a symbol of trade. There is a bandit that If you've collected too many resources, it will take away some. Or you might draw a special event card, which could really change the game, depending on what you uh, select, such or what you draw, such as Civil War, or Plague, or Year of Plenty, something like that. There's also 62 expansion cards in six decks. Uh, You start the game with three of them in your hand, and you can spend resources to to put those in play. Uh, A village can have two cards, one on top and one on the bottom, whereas a city can have up to four, and there's certain cards that have a red title bar that can only be played in cities, and those have various effects. Something like the aqueduct prevents plague, uh, bathhouse does the same thing, and so on. Anyway, you're trying to collect a number of victory points. It's usually 10 in the base game, and you get those by having villages and cities, uh, various uh, improvements, and again, having a large military or large trade. And it really is a clever re-implementation of Catan for two players. It gets the same same feel of the game without... Because if you try to play Catan on the regular map, it, you would there'd be no conflict. There'd, there'd be too much room to expand. Whereas here, you are competing. There's only a limited number of fields and villages you can get. So one player is inevitably going to have more villages than the other if they go that route. And the strategy could be you don't care. Instead, you're going to build up cities and try to get even more expansions and try to get victory points through that route. So there's a lot of different ways to victory. And it's, a, like I said, a very clever re- re-implementation of Catan. Neat. I hadn't heard of the Catan card game. We really do love it. And if if I had to give this a rating, I would rate it a solid five. It is absolutely one of my favorite games, and I don't think it'll ever leave my collection, uh, barring theft. <laughs> so, <laughs> Is it still in print? The Rivals for Catan is. I think they just released a new... Uh, big box version or deluxe version which includes the expansions in it I, i've seen it at my local game store yeah it's it's available and you should be able to buy it about anywhere oh very cool all right my first game is called lost cities i first heard about this game on the dice tower tom vassal likes to talk about how this is his one of his wife's favorite games in lost cities you have a very thin player board i mean it's about six inches across and about two feet long. The cards are, I think they're called tarot style, tarot sized cards. They're bigger than normal playing cards. And each card has a colored number on it. 
and then some artwork. And the idea is that you're going on an expedition to find lost cities, but you have to pay for your expedition. So what you are trying to do is you are starting these rows of cards that you're going to stack top of each other, but you want to be able to see all the numbers. And you have to put colors with colors. So yellow numbers go with yellow numbers, green numbers go with green numbers, etc. But you're supposed to start with the lowest possible number. And if any numbers that you skip are out, you can't add them back in later. And they also have these cards that have, they look like two hands doing a handshake. If you want to use those, you have to put those down before you put down any numbers. And you can put down as many of those as you want. Those are an agreement to help you pay for the expedition for that particular color. But once you start putting down numbers, you can't put down any more handshakes. And so you want to start with one or two, and then hopefully you'll draw the three and then the four. You might see your opponent play the five, so you know you're not getting the yellow five. So then you put down, you know, the yellow seven. Well, that leaves five and six out, even if six were to come up. You couldn't put that down. And it just continues until the draw pile is empty. You can either play a card into your tableau, or if there's no card that you want to play into your tableau, then you would play a card onto the board between the two of you. And your options are to either draw a card from the face-up cards on the board or to draw from the draw pile. And it plays pretty quickly. The, the box is 30 minutes. I'd say this can play in about 20 to 30 minutes. Mark and I enjoy this game. We get pretty cutthroat with it, but we get pretty cutthroat with just about any game. So <laughs> I've also played this game with my sister-in-law and she did really well at it. Thinking about showing this one to my mom, I think she would enjoy it. It's an easy to learn game. It's designed by Reiner Knizia. And it's published by Cosmos. It came out in 1999. So it's been out for a while. It's still in print. I bought my copy at Viking Hobby here in Carmichael in the Sacramento area. When Mark and I want to sit down and play a nice, easy two-player game, because, you know, we've had a taxing day, and, and but a game sounds like fun, this is one that we go to and pull out and really enjoy. And I give it a good solid four on the scale. It actually has a nice organizer in the box too that holds everything in place really nicely. It holds the cards in place. The board folds on top of it. It stays in place. The box lid is a little loose, so I have a box rubber band on it. But otherwise, you don't open it up and everything's all jumbled. So it's a nice, easy, simple game. And I really enjoy it. And that is Lost City. Have either of you ever played that game? That's been one I've been wanting to play, but I haven't had a chance to. Uh, I've heard very good things. I want to say I might have played the app. It sounds very familiar, but I'm trying to remember if it was one I tried either online like Yukata or uh, Board Game Arena or if I actually had an app for it. I just didn't find it all that engaging. And then, of course, it wouldn't do any sense to buy it with Will because of the color issue. Mm -hmm. But I was going to say, I think I saw someone a while ago didn't really care much for, well the theme or more I should say just the art so they made their own version with different types of cars and mm. so each grouping was like a different line of cars so like trucks or old classic cars or planes it was vehicles it was just vehicles in general so like one of them was planes uh, boats and somehow that worked better for him and whoever he was playing with so I Found okay. that interesting. I like the artwork. I like the theme. I love archaeology. Yeah. So, you know, it works for us. That's good. Yeah. So, Sarah, what's next on your list? All right. So, this is my favorite two player variant game that's normally or can be, you know, more players. And that would be Dresden Files Cooperative Card Game, which I'm sure you all have remembered. I've talked about that, this game quite a bit lately. Really enjoyed it. It's designed by Eric Vogel, published by Evil Hat Productions. It plays one to five players in about 30 minutes. So in brief, you are trying to solve the case from each of from each book in the series. So for those who don't know, Dresden Files is a series of novels written by Jim Butcher. Will and I are huge fans, so that also helps for us. Will and I, our enjoyment of it is increased because we love the books. So through the game, you're trying to solve more cases uh, than foes left on the board at the end of the game. Uh, each player is one of the characters from the books, and on your turn, you're either going to play a card from your hand or use your character card for an, its effect. Now, a card can be either played for its effect or to gain fate points back. Each card played 
for its effect has that fate point cost. So you have to balance using up fate and regaining fate. So there's that balance there. And Will and I, again, just we really love this. It lets us play the different characters through the novels. It's kind of a what if retelling because you can play characters that don't show up till book five in the series, but you can play them in book one. So why I like the two player variant is because each player gets to play two characters and you shuffle their cards together and you draw from the mix. So it feels like you're playing a tag team. And I really enjoy that. And you get both of the character cards in front of you. And I just feel like I have a lot more choices than when I'm just playing one character in a three plus player game. I also like that you only have to work with one other person. And it just, I find it easier. Um, this game does limit your communication. So you have to have a group that really knows how to communicate within those limits. And Will and I just work so well together that we fall into a good pattern when playing this. Now, we haven't always won. It's just that I feel like the game's a lot more, uh, a lot easier and a lot more fun because of how much we love the books and we just really enjoy the experience. So, but I will play this at any player count. Uh, it's a, the game's a five out of five for me, regardless. And I still have one more play of it for my 10 by 10 challenge. <laughs> so I thought I was going to get that to the table in June, but the Kickstarter just kind of took over my life. So hopefully in July, I'll get that final play done. How good. Now, I remember that they did a series on, I think, Fox for the Dresden Files. For the artwork in this game, are they using like shots from the television show or are they using more of the book's art style? Neither. And I'm really glad they're not pulling off the TV show because that was a terrible TV show. But they actually had people, uh, they hired artists to draw art for these it's very it's specific art for the game oh okay it is done in the style of the role-playing book so people will see similarities if you pick up a dresden files role-playing book it's a very similar i don't know if it's exactly the same artist but it's a lot of the same feeling i think they do mimic the book covers for the cover card there's a card that shows the the cover for the book and i believe then they actually did an imitation of what's on the actual book if you go buy it off the shelves. But no, it's all original art, which is kind of neat because they, they didn't get to stretch goals to allow them to do unique art on all the cards. So when you're playing through a character, several cards that are differently named have the same art, but you'll find aspects of the card in the art. So they, they mixed the concepts of the different cards into one art piece. So I can't come up with any examples off the top of my head, but you look at the, there's three different cards. They all have the same art, but they make sense with what you can find in the art. Oh, okay. Kind of think of like Dixit. Dixit has a lot of different things in the art, that kind of thing. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. And what rating do you give this game? A five out of five. I will always want to play this game. Um, any count actually, although I have yet to play it at five players. So, or one or solo play. But I've played it two, three, and four, and I will play it no matter what. Fantastic. All right, Jesse. Well, I really love cooperative games, and I'm a role-playing guy, so I thought I'd include a cooperative game. And it'll be a little odd the one I pick, and I'll explain that later. But I, I chose to talk about Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition from Fantasy Flight Games. The designer is Dickie Valens, and it came out last year in 2016. Uh, this is very much in, in the genre of a dungeon crawler, but it's very different in that you're exploring uh, usually a mansion or other building, looking for clues to solve a mystery. And it's a mystery dealing with Lovecraftian horror, so things from, from beyond, dark rituals, cultists, and the like. It is an app-driven game, which you can download for your smartphone or tablet. I will warn you, it's a bit of a battery hog. I usually try to keep mine plugged in while playing it. But it does a very good job of telling the story. Uh, it has background music playing. It helps you guide the actions, tells you what happens when you select actions, such as looking for clues or checking out this book on a bookshelf or there's some litter on the floor. What's that? Where you hear a scream in the next room, you open the door, what do you find? And it's hard to describe all of that without giving spoilers, so I won't, because these games are worth playing uh, for the, the atmosphere and the story. And I've played the first scenario a few times, and it changes slightly every time you play, so there is some replayability in those scenarios. You can control one or more investigators. With two players, I would probably try to have one person at least control two. 
if not both of you. The game scales automatically through the app, depending on the number of people you use. Each individual investigator has both a health and a sanity. When one gets depleted, uh, you start having negative effects. Health, it's usually with movement or combat. Sanity, you, you may get all of a sudden a new goal. Maybe you want to tank the scenario because you want the bad guys to win all of a sudden. And they also have different abilities such as uh, strength, agility, observation, lore, influence, and will. But not every combat encounter will rely on strength. Sometimes, you know, with uh, monsters with magical abilities, you might need a, a stronger influence or will to combat them. So just because you have the highest strength in the group doesn't mean you should go out and look for trouble. And in fact, looking for trouble in, in combat is a good way to get your character eliminated quickly. It is a brutal, brutal game. So if you're looking for something hack and slashy, uh, this is not the game for you. This is a thinker. And I really enjoy it. If Again, on the scale, I would, for me, I have to give it a 4. Everybody else who likes this sort of game will give it a 5. I'll give it a 4 because I'm not the biggest Lovecraft fan. If it was a more generic horror game, this, this would be a solid 5 easily. And even though I'm not the biggest Lovecraft fan, that does not detract from this game that much. It is, it is outstanding. And the best part is, since it's app-driven, no one has to be the GM. No, There's no one versus many here like they did with the first edition or with other dungeon crawlers. So everyone gets a chance to play and take part in the mystery. So I, I heartily recommend Mansions of Madness second edition. So you like it in spite of the theme? Oh, yeah. I mean, this is one of those times that the mechanics, the story, the mood, everything they put into this game is amazing. So I'd be happy to play this again and again. Excellent. I haven't played either editions of it, so uh, I'll have to look for, see if one of my friends has a copy. I hope you can hope you get a chance to play it. Everyone should experience at least it once, just for the, the mood music alone is worth it. <laughs> Sarah, no, I don't think this is your type of game, right? No, not at all. <laughs> yeah, you're I, not a Lovecraftian fan either. No, I love co-ops, but I... It's got to be fantasy or sci-fi, not not horror, and definitely not Lovecraftian. Okay. But to each his own. That's why there's so many games out there. Absolutely. Exactly. Absolutely. All right. The final one I'm going to talk about, I changed direction while you guys were talking. Um, I was going to talk about Onitama, which I love. Onitama is a great game. But... I decided to change it up and talk about Seven Wonders Duel. One of the first, almost, I, I almost think of it as a party game because we always play with so many people. One of the first party games that I played when I got into the hobby was Seven Wonders and loved it. Once I got all the symbology figured out, which wasn't that difficult, loved it. Uh, went out and bought it, went out and bought the expansions because I started playing with all the expansions. My friend Dwayne. Hi, Dwayne. He had all of the expansions to it. And so I just learned that's how I learned the game. So when we bought it and it didn't have leaders and it didn't have cities, uh, we went ahead and, and bought those and just incorporated them. But it doesn't play two player well. It says it can play two player. And there's a two player variation where you have a dummy player that you take turns <laughs> controlling. It just, it's not that great. I mean, if you really need a Seven Wonders fix and there's only two of you, it worked. But when they came out with Seven Wonders Duel, which was uh, designed by Antoine Baza and Bruno Cathala and published by Repos Productions in 2015, this was an auto buy for us. We bought it as soon as we could and and have loved it. It's a little bit different. It still uses all the same symbology and art style and all of that that you see in Seven Wonders. The difference is, is that it has a little little board that you put out on the table. This board has two areas to it. The main area on it is the military track and it has a counter that starts right in the middle. And anytime anybody plays a military card, you get to mar march that counter. However many shields are on the card, you get to march the counter that number of spaces towards your opponent's end of the board. And if you get all the way to the end of the board without your opponent stopping you, then you win a military victory and the game is over. Then there are, there's actually three ways to win this game. There's the military victory, there's a scientific victory, and then there's just the points victory, like 
you win in in Seven Wonders. The cards are beautiful. They've also come out with an expansion called Pantheon. We have that and love it. The art on the cards is absolutely beautiful and it's indicative of the art that you see on the Seven Wonders cards. The symbols are the same. The card colors are the same. The wonders are, uh, again, tarot sized cards. And then the cards that you use for each age, there are three ages. They are the mini card size. But again, they're the same cards that you would use in Seven Wonders. So if you're already familiar with that game, this isn't going to throw any wrenches in it. The other thing that's a little bit different is there are these science tokens. They put in like nine or ten of them. But for each game, you randomly select five of them to put out on the military track board. It's a space above the military track. And you have the ability to obtain these if you get a certain sets of science symbols. The components in this game are outstanding. It's fun to play. We have managed to get both the scientific and the military victories. And I was surprised because I got the scientific victory. Actually, I think I got both of them when we first played. Mark usually does. And when he plays Seven Wonders, he's really heavy into science. And somehow I managed to pull out a scientific victory the first time that that we got that. So that was kind of fun. This is a great two player game. It plays in about 20 to 30 minutes. Like I said, anybody that is familiar with Seven Wonders is going to have an easy, easy time picking this up. And actually, to tell you the truth, my niece, Nicole, I don't think she'd ever played Seven Wonders. And I taught her Seven Wonders Duel and she picked it up right away. That is one of my favorite two player games. Did anybody have any on like a short list that you just want to mention briefly? Well, I was going to follow up on the Seven Wonders Duels. We've never okay. played, we never played Seven Wonders. So the duels was our first introduction to Seven Wonders. Because again, the closed-handed drafting is not good for Will's vision. But with duels, it's all open information. Yes. And we've only played it twice. Will has won both times. One with a military victory and one with a scientific victory. (laughs) (laughs) So haven't quite gotten it to the table again, but hoping to because I did enjoy it. He just picked up on it a bit faster than I did. But that happens. Yeah, that happens. that happens. But yeah, I did enjoy it. I mean, we still have it. It just doesn't warrant buying the expansion until we play it more. Yeah, because we do enough of the game buying and not playing. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I, I agree that it is a very good two-player game. So there, that's a one that's on my short list for two-player only games. We definitely enjoyed Seven Wonders Duel. Jesse, do you have any on a short list? Yeah, uh, again, I'll echo Seven Wonders Duel. Seven Wonders Duel is an amazing game. It does for Seven Wonders what the Catan card game card game does for Catan for a two player game. It's amazing. For a short list, gosh, I could list any of my favorite games as solid two players. The Networks does a really slick job of implementing a dummy third player that is very simple to control, and it's a reasonable two player game. Networks being one of my favorite favorite games. I would also put Terraforming Mars. I have played Terraforming Mars at all player counts and two players. It's a solid game. And the last one when talk when selecting a co op with a role playing theme i was tempted to talk about gloomhaven but i think that game has gotten so much hype i figured i'd talk about something else but gloomhaven again solid game if you ever get a chance to play it yeah yeah i had a chance to play that at conquest sack in april and it was a lot of fun i didn't play it two player but uh it was a lot of fun it's amazing how well designed that game is and how well it scales for two three or four player nice so my short list includes the age of war which is a dice rolling game uh, in which you're trying to capture castles in feudal Japan. And then Onitama, which is a good kind of kind of chess variant, but not as complex as chess. Small package. So, you know, like I said, uh, when we talked about summer vacation games, you can literally take this out and put it on the table between you and a restaurant and play before your food comes. Another one that I just played today for the first time that I think is a really good two-player game is Artifacts Incorporated. So had a lot of fun with that one. Okay, now I've had some time to think. (laughs) Go for it. I would agree on the networks. I love that. Just the game in general. It's a great game. I do mostly like the two-player variant. I just don't like the way the discs flip in the circle. It's fiddly. 
Normally, I don't have a problem with that, but I just tend to lose the discs better more than actually flipping them correctly. But other than that, I like the way that it a card is drawn and then stuff is discarded from the middle to get that random third player. Going back to games that Will and I absolutely love and some of the games we always go back to playing, just the two of us, and that would be Suburbia and Seasons. Those are our two probably just favorite games ever and we just I love playing them just with Will I mean I'll play them with other people too but yeah really enjoy Suburbia and Season cool what are your favorite two player games tell us in the guild guild number 2600 on Board Game Geek or you can also let us know on Facebook or Twitter give us some ideas what are some other great two player games that you enjoy playing and they don't have to be two player only they just play really well at two player Uh, Either they have a variant that plays well at two player or they were designed to play two players really well. So thanks for joining us, Jesse. Oh, thank you for having me. This is a this is a great time. Good. I hope you'll come back uh, and join us again sometime. Will do. This is Kathy. In episode number 40, we're doing something a bit different. We're having an Ask Us Anything episode and we want questions from you. If you would like to participate and ask us any question you like, just go to OurTurnPodcast.com slash AMA1. That's the number one. This is a link to the thread in our Board Game Geek Guild number 2600. Ask your questions here by July 23rd, 2017, and we will do our best to answer them in episode number 40. Please remember that we are a family-friendly show, and your questions should reflect that. Otherwise, we are open. Do you have questions about our favorite types of games or game mechanics? Are you curious about how a podcast is put together? Do you want to know if we have pets and what their names are? The questions you can ask are almost endless. We look forward to hearing from you. Again, the link to the BGG thread is OurTurnPodcast.com slash AMA1. We look forward to hearing from you. Okay, so now we're getting to the part of the show where we're winding things down and looking forward to what we're going to be doing over the next week or so. Sarah, what have you got coming up? Well, actually trying to get more of our unplayed games played. June was a really low play month, admittedly, because of the Kickstarter. Makes sense. We're busy. Hopefully Will and I can get some more games to the table. Plus, we're getting together with friends, constantly busy. My friends always complain, Sarah, why do I have to book a month ahead of time with you? And I'm like, because I get that busy. So <laughs> this upcoming Friday, trying to get some of our Lego friends over to play board games, which is always fun when our two hobbies can intermix. And then on Saturday, going over to some old friends who are just recently getting into board games, not our fault, but we're really happy. We tried earlier on in our friendship to get them into board games. Didn't work. So we laid off. We just were getting together every couple, about twice a year, just to stay friends, you know, because we want to stay friends, it's busy lives. And then the last time we got together, they're like, hey, we like board games. And we're like, okay, that's great. Let's get together more often then. So we're going to go over to their house and they're actually going to have eight people over total. So that'll be interesting. And then the following weekend, I'm sure we'll be getting together with more friends. And I think we have our lego club meeting so yeah fun 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 i have a library game day coming up next saturday so i'm looking forward to that i'm not sure what time it starts usually it starts around noonish i think and then we just go until everybody's ready to go home so it's one of the nice things about our community libraries they have these uh, community rooms with external exits and the bathrooms are available but you can't get into the library after the library closes but you can still get to the bathroom in the library and you can still go in and out of the community room as long as someone's there. And you can stay in until the next person who's coming over on Sunday to do whatever they're doing comes in. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's true. So yeah, we go and we have a great time playing these. Uh, we've met some great friends at these events and um, just have a great time. I think I'm going to take the Lord of the Rings dice building game to see, get that one played and Artifacts Inc. Other than that, we're getting ready to start the process of moving. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. So that should be fun. Not fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
like like the man says, the rents just got too dang high. And so it's time for us to uh, find a new place. But we're planning to move. Uh, I think we're going to move across town and move towards the south area, maybe down to, towards your area, Rancho Cordova. Ooh. We've got so many friends down in that area that it Yay. takes us an hour to get there and it takes them an hour to get to us. So since we're going to be moving anyway, why not move closer to our friends? That would be really cool. Have you guys actually over when we are trying to get you over? Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, that's going to be a big deal. We're planning to move from a four bedroom, two bath house to probably a two or three bedroom hopefully to bath house. Wow. But we don't know where yet. So that process is just getting underway. Good luck. Yeah. Also too, I am starting to write some game reviews and put them up on the Our Turn Podcast website, ourturnpodcast.com. So you can find those under game reviews on the menu. I also might start writing some articles, some game related articles that aren't necessarily game reviews, but they talk about gaming. So I just have been feeling the, the desire, the need to write. Nice. On the topic. So I'm going to start doing that. Yay. Yeah. See if I can't earn myself some geek gold. Oh, there you go. Anyway, that's what's going on with me. Anything else on your end? No, that's all I can think of is games and Lego and work. Okay. And food. And food. Food is good. Yeah, food is always good. <laughs> all right, where can people find you online, Sarah? All right, you can find me mostly on Twitter at EurogamerGirl. Otherwise, I run the uh, Our Turn Podcast Facebook page. So if you're commenting on any of the posts there, I'm usually the one that responds. Otherwise, you'll find me at various board game groups on Facebook as well. Okay, you can find me. I run the Our Turn Podcast Twitter account. So that's at Our Turn Podcast on Twitter. And then I am also the guild master on our Board Game Geek Guild number 2600. Post questions there daily. Sarah posts the same questions on Facebook. So if you prefer to interact on Facebook or the guild, either way is fine. We also post the same questions on um on Twitter, of course, they're usually a little more abbreviated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sarah, Sarah writes the questions for us, and sometimes she gets a little long-winded with them. Sorry. But that's okay. That's okay. I can shorten them down for, for Twitter. Yeah. Anyway, so that's how you can get a hold of us. We love talking to people. We love interacting with people. Yep. I have scheduled and done several interviews of people that I have met through Twitter, and you'll be hearing those in coming weeks. So uh, I'm looking forward to those. Anyway, uh, until next time, that was our turn. Now it's yours. Thank you for listening. This episode is recorded on July 10th, 2017 and is written and produced by Kathy Ford and Sarah Reed with assistance from Jesse Metcalf, Tanya DePass, and Mark Ford. Next time we will discuss space-themed games. We want and encourage your questions, comments, and feedback. Please call 916-426-2873 and leave us a short voicemail or send an email to feedback at ourturnpodcast.com. Our theme music was composed by Adriana Crickle. Please check out our show notes to learn more about the composers featured in this episode. The material in this episode is copyrighted under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. If you want to learn more about the games discussed in this episode, please visit our website at OurTurnPodcast.com slash episode 38. You can find a list of the games along with links to their listing on BoardGameGeek.com and an affiliate link to buy the games, which also helps to support the show. We are proud members of the Dice Tower Network. You can find out about other shows in the network like the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast, Onboard Games, or Ludology by going to Dicetowernetwork.com. Thank you for your support. If you like what you heard, please tell your friends about us.